You're listening to the Platte River Bard. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Platte River Bard. This is Chris Berger. And I'm Sherry Berger. This is our first Director's Roundtable, and we couldn't be more pleased with how it went. We spoke to theater professors at two local universities, Jamie Bullins and Ron Zank. Ron Zank is an assistant professor of theater at the University of Nebraska Omaha. He has a BA in English from UNL, an MA in theater from UNO, and a PhD in theater from the University of Missouri Columbia. Ron was able to reveal to us the new season for UNO Theater. Only because we actually did announce it last night, so I can actually announce our season for oh, next yes, year. Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. I would like to hear that. So, yeah, so our first production will be Dracula. Nice. Ooh. Then we're doing Anything Goes, which I'm directing and I'm really excited about. Um, and it's going to be, it's cool the way it works out. The opening night of Anything Goes is actually going to be the 90th anniversary of it premiering on Broadway. Nice. Which is really no cool. kidding. Oh. Nice. Yeah. And then um, February, we're going to be doing, it's the 20th anniversary of our college. So we're going to be doing a big collaboration with a lot of the other departments. So it's going to be like a multi-evening thing. And then for the last production, we're actually doing Alice in Wonderland. Nice. Wow. Students are super jazzed about it. They suggested it. So it's like, okay, here we go. Awesome. Jimmy Bellins is an associate professor of theater at the Johnny Carson School of Theater and Film at UNL and also advises for their student-run theater, Theatrics. Jamie specializes in costume design, but you may have seen a play that he has been involved in at several Lincoln and Omaha theaters. He is also a scene designer and a playwright. Jamie has an MFA in theatrical design scenography from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and he moved to Lincoln from Atlanta, Georgia. Jamie is also staff for the Angels Theatre Company's Playwriting Collective. Uh, Jamie wasn't able to tell us the season for Nebraska Repertory Theatre yet. However, we can remind you that his Playwriting Collective with Angels Theatre Company will be bringing us the First Flight Festival, July 18th through the 28th in Lincoln. If you have a question you would like asked at our future roundtables, let us know at admin at platriverbard.com. We thank Ron and Jamie for their fun conversation about theater and their insight about directing. And now, on to our first Director's Roundtable. Because we're here with Ron Zank. He's the assistant professor at UNO Theater. We're also here with Jamie Bullins. He's an associate professor at Johnny Carson School of Theater and Film in Lincoln at UNL. Oh, look at that. That was perfect. We got it all in. (laughs) And uh, we are here at the Gretna Library. Yeah, we're here at the Gretna Library. We're going to start because this is a weird episode. It is. We like weird. (laughs) And that's okay. This is is our first little experiment. We call this the the Director's Roundtable. If you you love this idea... um, then it's our idea. <laughs> if you hated this idea, it was totally Sherry's idea. <laughs> I work so hard. No, you do. You do, so Sherry. Don't, don't make us separate you two. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't know how to tear this thing down. So <laughs> just be here. Exactly. So, yeah, so uh, we are here, and, I, and, and, and this is kind of good because um, both, of, um, both of our directors today are, are from... Uh, the local uh, universities, universities so. and they both have been on the podcast before. Yes, so we kind of have a theme, yeah, and that's uh, sort of uh, school directors in a way, mm-hmm. um, which is going to be slightly different from directors in other places. So absolutely, I like it. And I so, like it. and hopefully, we can talk a little bit about university slant to some of these questions as well. So, mm-hmm. I just have some some random questions that I'm going to start with. She has a bunch gonna... of questions she threw in a box. That's right. And we're just going to go with it and see what happens. There's a lot and of them in there. <laughs> there is. <laughs> I, I'm thinking they, long term. Oh, okay. I know, yes. Okay, okay. They, 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 Your soccer game is tomorrow, right? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah right? <laughs> we don't have to go through all of them. There was one no. of them that if we get to it, I, I'm going to have to ask you what you meant by it. <laughs> so the first question is... <laughs> she got it. Do you conduct table reads for the first rehearsal? Oh, do you do table reads or do you get it uh, do you get it up? Um, I'm, I mean, it kind of depends on who's directing, but I would say for the most part, yeah, we do table reads. Um, you, you it's, it's usually, 
I think also too because a lot of times that first rehearsal is also a lot of times the designer presentation, so the cast gets to see like what the set and costumes are going to look like. So oh, nice. yeah, table read is cool. pretty common for us. Yeah, so. same same with me. I mean, the first rehearsal definitely. But I mean, I, I don't know how to add on to this, but like you guys know, I just directed the flick recently. Yes, and uh, we spent almost ten days doing table work. Really? Oh yeah. sure. Before first we, ten before, days before yeah. you got it, before we blocked anything at all, we just sat around the table and read and talked about the character. I mean, we spent almost—I mean, basically two weeks of rehearsal doing table work. So uh, it, dep- it depends on the show. And I stole that from a very fantastic director I know named Jason, and uh, he spends more time around the table than he does on their feet. Oh, wow. he just thinks really? That, yeah, he he thinks would rather that, be reading at the table. It's weird, but uh, it depends on the piece. I mean, if the piece is text heavy, I mean, there's not a lot of blocking in the flick. They walked around and swept up popcorn. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was easy yes. to, to, to implement it into the movement of the play because there wasn't really anything. Kind you know. of. But there are some shows that require, you know, a lot, a lot more right. of that. And so you don't you don't have the luxury of a lot of table work. Yeah, mm. So, And when we do it at the, at the loft, there is no table. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we'll, we'll have a quote-unquote table read the first time. We'll, we'll just, just sit, sit around in the seats and, and read yeah. the show. But, yeah. Okay. Use the first couple it's of times. It's not all official we'll and everything. We should get, right. you, we should <laughs> get you guys a table. Yeah, I know. I mean, we, we have <laughs> tables. Table. So we just don't set them up. <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying that you have costumes and stuff there as well. You do not see. the actual costumes, but oh. things like the rendering oh, yeah, and the model yeah. and that sort of thing. The That's presentation awesome. of the we do that too. Yeah. aspects of the show. Okay. Yep. I enjoy that. All right. Next random question. <laughs> okay. Next random answer. Oh, can I, can I throw us before, before you do that? Yes. I, have a, I have a question for Ron. Yes, so, please do it. Do you find, uh, uh, well, I'm principally a designer, right? So teaching my students that it's important to be at the table read, to hear it. Ours tend to be there, and they, yeah. I think they really enjoy it, um, in part because they love getting the feedback of, like, the cast, say, like, seeing a costume sketch or something mm. like that. So that's exciting for them. Yeah. But also, too, so many of mine... <laughs> Don't figure out like how good a script is or how funny it is or anything like that until they hear it out loud. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and you know, as for, as a board member for us in trying to do things like outreach and education and all of that, we're always struggling. Going, where can I get the script so I can read it? It'd be great if we could be part of that. But we get um, just like a synopsis mm. oh. sent out of each one so that helps so if you can't get to the book or even see the movie or whatever that you at least have something because mm-hmm. yeah, it, sure. it does help mm-hmm. right oh, in absolutely. all the things you have to do um, so and I think both of you have this how do you handle scene changes quickly <laughs> <laughs> quickly yeah with no curtain yeah with very little uh, Bruhaha. I just, yeah, I hate. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm all. I'm me being principally a designer, and I do a lot of scene design. I'm like, no, scene changes have to be like fast, fast. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, I'm not slowing the play down because like, I'm waiting for somebody to haul out a bunch of chairs. I just can't do it. So you don't go almost dark or anything. No, I mean, it's, it's it like depends. A blue light. It depends on the need of the show, but yeah. like, I mean, because we've got a black box theater, so yeah, we're not. We're yeah. almost never using never a curtain. Stage. Yeah. So sure. um, so yeah, it's usually you know I either. It's dimming out, or we're transitioning in such a way so that something is happening on one side of the stage and something is changing on the other. But yeah, oh, sure. I am. I I hate the old school thing of like we go completely to black and hear people running into furniture in the dark, yes. Yes. falling off the stage. Yes. So yeah, there's a director I worked with years ago, and that was how she always did her shows. Mm. And then I showed her like how we could actually make the scene change as part of the action, and she was so excited. She was like doing <laughs> it was a new concept. Yeah. Well, and and I think we cut probably like 10 minutes off of what the show time was. Oh, I bet you did. Because it's faster and it's more efficient. So. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So, well, Does that, that affect your choices? Again, well, in terms yeah. of plays? Yeah. Like, no, nope, I don't if, think so. If, if you're not dealing with, oh, I don't have a proscenium, I don't have a, you know, a, 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 a curtain, I don't, I'd rather not deal with that show. I mean, there's a or, few things where we look at where where maybe we say, like, wow, there's so much that needs to change that maybe we don't want to do that. Or how can oh, we do fair. that in a yeah. different way? You know, we've got <laughs> we've got one student right now, and he really, really wants us to do Phantom. And, oh, it's, like, okay. and it's like, we don't have a proscenium space. We don't have a fly system. It's going to be really, really hard to do Phantom. And yeah. and it's not that we couldn't do it, but it's not going to be, like, not the Phantom that he wants. The space, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be Phantom like at the Orpheum. So, yeah. Sure, so, sure. 
Fair, fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's great. It's a great challenge for the design team, right? For the scene designers and to, to figure out how to make those changes happen. But I, I don't want to ever, as a director or a designer, put obstacles or opportunities for my audience to feel disconnected. And that's to go to black and move around the scenery is an opportunity for them to check out. Mm-hmm. And we have short attention spans. And mm-hmm. so it's like, you give me an opportunity to check out, I'm going to check out. Yeah. Or, or if you put an op, I call it, obstacles I'm like I'm not trying to put any obstacle between the story and the audience and a long ass scene change is an obstacle right and so I don't want because I mean even if you're especially if you're theater people and something like that happens mm-hmm. I'm sitting there thinking what went wrong yeah mm-hmm. that's what's true, happening mm-hmm. yeah is someone dead uh, <laughs> yeah. you know uh, because we're sitting there that long I just can't right. I can't do it. Yeah. it it's well and it has to do again with our attention span but also it's about flow yeah. yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to stop the show because no. we got to bring out a couch. Mm-hmm. I mean, put it on wheels and roll it out sounds great. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, get it out there. Yeah, yeah. Scene changes have to be fast, and uh, it, because it's the story has you know it has rhythm and you know, yeah. You yeah. Wanna, well, and there's so many shows too where if you do have something like a long scene change, it just kills the energy. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Absolutely. it's sort of like you know, oh, what were what were we listening to? What were you yeah. paying attention to? So yeah. yeah. Because I started thinking about, oh, I got to go to the grocery store. Or, you know. Right. It's like, um, yeah. which this, uh, the theatrics is doing this play right now called Act a Lady. And I will admit, not my favorite play. Uh, just the way the writing, I'm not a huge fan of it. But there's this really fantastic line toward the end of it. It's about putting on a play. And this lady is talking about her experience with it. And she refers to it. She said, well, I think it was art. Sort of. Because I felt like I went there and part of me stayed. Hmm. Mm. And I was like, oh, no, that's... I'm like, yeah. why is that line not somewhere else? Because it's at the end. I had to wait all that time <laughs> just to get to that. Yeah. Um, but it was one of those situations like you read a play or you see a play and one thought comes out of it and you're like, well, that's going to stick with me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's what I, I can, you're not going to have that experience if there's all this stopping uh, and taking mm-hmm. you out of, of the, the movement the of, the, of the play. Mm-hmm. So. And one of the things when I was researching, you know, coming up with questions one of the things I was thinking was I I recently attended a a play and they had a curtain but they had it open so I was sitting there looking at the set 15 minutes before the show even started Mm -hmm. and I have to say I kind of walked away a little disappointed I felt a little underwhelmed that that fancy reveal Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I can't remember the last time we brought in the main curtain in our space we have one in the Howl, our perceived mm-hmm. space, but I don't, I don't even know what color it is. And I like a minimal <laughs> set. Like, Beatrix does a lot of yeah. minimal, but... Um, yeah, I mean, there's some shows where a thir- curtain can really work. Exactly. It can really make a difference, yeah. but yeah, it just yeah. depends yeah. on the needs. But yeah, well, and really, especially if you're talking newer shows, most of them aren't written that way anymore, yeah. just because there's a lot of theaters that aren't working aren't in that situation. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you because know, like you know, the like classic musicals, they had those little tiny scenes that were meant to be performed in front oh, of the curtain because yeah. you knew there was a monstrous scene change going on behind the curtain. For sure, right? And so, yeah, just don't do that anymore. Yeah. Cool. Grab one. I'll keep going unless anybody has any better questions. I just love the mystery of what the <laughs> question's going to be. <laughs> What's next? How do standing ovations make you feel? No, <laughs> how do they make you feel? <laughs> Um, <laughs> what are your feelings? I, I think there are good things and bad things about standing ovations. I think Fair. I think they've I think they're happening maybe a little too frequently at this point. Um, but sometimes I mean I mean it's tough because if you're dealing with the university show, you're dealing with a community show. Sometimes it's you know because the people there know the actors and they're really excited and they want them to yep. know that we appreciate their work. Um, but even too, I see it you know when I go to shows at the Orpheum or I go to the Lead Center. Um, I think part of it sometimes is like that show is really long and I just need to stand up. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think they used to mean more than they, they do now. Um, but now right. it's pretty much common. Yeah. So, yeah, I was at a show, a couple shows recently where, like, I stayed seated and the person next to me said, are you okay? And I'm like, really? I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I just, I just didn't have to leap to my feet. I, I, yeah. I have strong feelings. You about many feelings. things, and of course, this is one of them. <laughs> Go for uh, it. I agree. I think they're much more common now, and I think people are doing it just because they feel like they have to. Mm-hmm. It feels the only time that I yeah. there are two reasons that I will stand up during a curtain call. One okay. is because I am drawn to something has happened in the evening that I need to support in that way. Right? If I am drawn out of my seat, I will do it. That happens maybe one time out of fifty. 
right? Certainly not as often. And the other thing that I use standing ovations for is to get out early so I can get to my car and get out of the <laughs> parking deck before other people get there. In fact, I went to see Mean Girls last week. Oh. It was a good show. It was a good show. But I was tired. And the lead is freaking huge. And the yes. traffic getting out of there is insane. So literally, as soon as the applause started and everybody jumped to their feet, I was out. Yes. I got to my car and I got out of the parking garage before the pedestrians behind me even got to the sidewalk. That's I was the first one out of the garage. Theater goer. My girlfriend yells at me all the time because we go see shows. And I'm like, oh, standing ovation. Let's go. Let's go. And, she's, and she's like, no, no, we have to. St-. I was like, no, I don't. I'm using this as an escape. Uh, and so, uh, but I will stay and I will participate in a standing ovation if I feel drawn to, right? You Fair. tell me a story that moves me to my feet, yeah. then I'm up. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the first person. And I don't care if anybody stands up or not. If I move to my feet, then I'll do it. But the people who just do it like, I mean. Kind of automatic. Yeah, when they just pop up and I'm like, did you see the same show I did? Because that sucked. Yeah. <laughs> Are you just, what are you doing? You just being you know? nice. I also wonder, too, sometimes I feel like people are doing it because, like, oh, these tickets were really expensive. So, like, I want to have the full experience. So, it's, sure, it's sure. sort of like, you know, what's what's the point of riding the ro- roller coaster if I'm not going to throw my arms but, up? Yeah. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, okay, I've done it all. Like, you know, I cer- like experience. when I see stuff in New York, I certainly feel that sometimes. Because, right. some, you know, yeah. a lot of stuff is amazing, but there's some stuff I'm like, yeah, and people are like, oh, leaping to their feet. And yeah. I'm like, you don't go to this very often. Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're not a. You're not. You don't do this all the time, right? Because yeah, if you're so. in the theater all the time, I'm not. I just. Yeah. Mm, do it. you feel that when you want to to stand and give a standing ovation that it's at the same place a lot, or is it really random? Like the, sh- is it the show or the place or? I, for me, I think it's the show. I also, the I, show. I also think it too depends on, on a particular performance. That for me is often. Mm-hmm. What will prompt a standing standing ovation is yeah, like somebody has an ama- you know did an amazing yeah. thing or or yeah. you know um, you know somebody has a massive monologue or somebody has goes through this big emotional cycle. Um, I think the last one where I really started it was because I also knew stuff other people didn't, which was that the lead actor had been replaced three days before opening mm-hmm. and had learned the whole show in basically 72 hours so like yeah i am there for you and wow, i support you yeah. and yeah so mm-hmm. yeah incredible I, I think i stood up at a high school musical i saw recently i saw something rotten recently and i saw adam's family i couldn't remember i can't remember which one but i think i stood up at one of them mm-hmm. only because i was like that was an accomplishment good I, you did a, you good you did good work and you're 12 so yeah you, yeah, you know, yeah right yep uh and so uh i think that was something but i again i was moved you don't have to be moved by you know what necessarily I mean, we know a lot of things that a lot of people don't know and so yeah. um, yeah. for good and for bad <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah. right yeah so, yeah but people who just do it just because they feel like it's expected or as part of the experience i usually am the person sitting next to them going <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> jamie's looking around i'm like what what's going on <laughs> and my girlfriend's like come on come on, get it, come on get it, get it. i'm like now what, is there a fire or are we in danger? Right. Yeah. yeah. No, she she doesn't tug on my sleeve. She's very sweet. <laughs> well, and it's funny you mentioned the escape because um, I saw a touring production of Greece in St. Louis and a friend wanted to go because he was actually directing it that summer. And I'm like, okay, sure, why not? Well, the big draw for this was that Taylor Hicks from American Idol uh, was playing Teen Angel. That's oh, the only uh, thing he did in the whole show. Okay. So it's like, okay, fine. It's a good work if you can get it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, saw the show. The production was fine. He was okay. Then we get to the end. We get all the way through curtain call. Okay, great. Nice work. We applaud everything. And then he comes out with his guitar. Oh, no. Oh, no. And we are trapped while he performs five numbers from his new album. Five? Yes. And everybody around me is so excited. And I'm I'm sitting in there going like, (laughs) why didn't I bolt when I had this shit? Oh, (laughs) no. Trapped by the Taylor Hicks concert. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) But they were super excited. You know, they felt like they got something extra. I'm sure, yeah. I was just mad because I, it was delaying dinner. So right. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, sometimes when it's over, you're like, "It's been a long day. It's mm-hmm. like it's almost eleven o'clock. I'm old and tired. Yep. And right. I need to go now home." A concert. Yeah, from Taylor. Taylor Hicks. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I'm kind Sorry, of Sorry, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you hear this, we yeah, we meant it. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of wonder if, as 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 some of our audience ages, 
if the, the longer shows deter them from coming and if we need to move to shorter shows I, mean, I think absolutely I mean I mean well and I think audiences just in general because also too in the attempt to s- tell stories efficiently we have more and more shows where there's not even an intermission yeah yeah and it's so true. if you're going to do that you don't want to have a super long show right. um, yeah. it's like 90 minutes you can do 90 right. minutes without an intermission right. get people out you can yes do that. Yeah. well and and I know Paula Vogel said in an article a few years ago she said I started writing shorter shows because I got tired of going to a show and leaving and saying I want that three hours of my life back. Right. Oh, man. So she's like, mine are like 85, 90 minutes. If mm-hmm. you don't like it, you're not there long and you're out. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, but I, th- I think there really is, you know, our, our attention spans are shorter. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, I think they're efficient ways of telling things where we don't have to be there forever. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some stories that are big stories and we have to take some time with them. But there's others. I think especially, too, if it's going to be a long show without an intermission, you're not really serving your audience well. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. the other thing I've discovered as you know, both a playgoer and as somebody who's, you know, producing work is that if you don't provide an audi- an intermission, the audience will make one. Yeah. Right. They will find a moment yeah. to yeah. get up. To get up and, and go to the bar yeah. or go to the bathroom. Right. Or, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I totally agree with that. 90 minutes in and out. I don't even mind if you give me an intermission and split it up to sh- two short halves. I don't care. But I'm also a big hypocrite because I just directed the flick, which was three hours long. <laughs> sure. And, but, uh, and so, say, yes, but that's that also one, one, too, where it needs it. it yeah, needs it does. It's captivating and, you know, it, 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 Well, and it, it lives up to it, right? I mean, I think, mm-hmm. I think it, it, you know, you can justify it. But I got, I got word sure. from audiences. They were like, why is it so long? And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? Go talk to Annie Baker. And it won a Pulitzer, so you can just exactly. uh, go yeah. home and watch TV. Uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, so yeah. it's. I think it's. It's a general. It's a general. I guess nicety to mm-hmm. write a play that is. You know, and I know that when people are choosing seasons, they're not looking at you know things that are three, four hours long because mm-hmm. who's going to do that? Nobody's going to sit through that anymore. Uh, so. And I hear that. I hear directors talking all the time. You know that they're trying to move it along so they can get out earlier. And then I kind of wonder if, and your audience. They both of them probably skew a little bit younger than some mm. of the other mm-hmm. um, sure, yeah, places in town or yeah. in the area. Yeah. We're mean and we force them to go see shows. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just the older people who are, you know, their bones are bothering them or yeah, anything right. like that. It's well, attention. And, and when you're being trained by something like movies, and most movies now are like 90 minutes, you know, mm-hmm. that's that's sort of our expectation. It, hours, un- yeah. Unless we know it's some epic thing and we know it's, we're going to be sitting there for right. a while. Yeah. But overall, yeah, it's we're used to a shorter time. Mm-hmm. And um, well, I think we, even in films, like the longer films, we see like what, the Lord of the Rings films and some other films that have been. There was a film that came out not too long ago and people were like, well, just be prepared. It's three hours long. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of like we go see those and t- after about an hour and a half we keep looking for ends mm. oh this must be the end oh it's not the end oh, oh yeah, this must yeah. be the end oh yeah. it's not yeah. you know and so yeah, yeah um, that happens uh, that happened to me I can't remember what film it was I saw recently but I thought it was ending like four different times and I was like wow what? when is this going to be over uh, I've seen four endings yeah. and so but yeah it's uh, we're just um, I don't know we don't have the patience mm-hmm. as a culture that we used to so. I wonder if that creates a secondary market for some of these older shows they go back and readapt them into a shorter version i think there's absolutely something to that well and the other thing too is that because the technology has changed then we don't need the scenes in one we can do transitions where it keeps moving and and things move along but you know i i have people saying from time to time you know oh why don't you do something like arsenic and old lace and i'm like i love arsenic and old lace it is three hours long it is but it's really funny it's Uh, it's really funny but it's really long it is it is um one of my students uh we're starting to gather plays for oh i probably maybe i shouldn't say this out loud on a radio thing uh or a podcast okay maybe but um we're doing uh we're gathering um information for next year's season for the student group theatrics and somebody put angels in america Mm. (laughs) oh wow in the in the folder and i pulled my board member one of my board members aside who's going to be the artistic director next year and i was like do you know how long that is? <laughs> yeah. And she was like, I don't know. I was like, it runs about four hours. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and mm-hmm. Angels is one of those stories that is worth watching and right. staying for the four hours. But man, 
we just don't have the the that's a lot yeah and the yeah. other thing too is that means you've got to allow more time to rehearse it yeah that's that's you, that's you know it's not something it. you can just fling on its feet and it's like yeah. okay yeah. we're good to go like right. you've really got to spend time with it that's so. the first thing that comes to my head is how much more rehearsal time mm-hmm. yeah. that, that a, a long show like that is going to require yeah and you're yeah. stuck with it really you can't you can't really cut it. Can oh gosh, no, not no, legally. No, no, so, no, 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 no. You're no. stuck. That's part of the conversation I had with. We had an Ollie group. Do you guys know what Ollie is? It's the long, lifelong learning groups that are yeah, around the town. Oh, downtown. They oh, came. Yeah. They came to mm-hmm. uh, do a tour uh, and talk to the designers and the actors in the flick before we opened. And one yeah. of the ladies asked me. She said, "Well, what do you do if there are things you want to cut?" And I'm a huge champion of the playwright and I was like then you do a different play right. yeah. yeah. I was like I'm not cutting anything <clears throat> I was no. like I'm not taking a word out of I was like look directors worth their salt don't do that I was like they pick plays that they can do intact yeah. that tell the story that they want to tell I was like Annie Baker's one Annie Baker's play won a Pulitzer Prize I'm not I'm not gonna touch it I was like I know it's long fair enough but I'm not changing a word uh, and I don't I don't edit scripts when I direct I just yeah. I do it as written or I choose a different play yeah so every so often there will be one where I would like to make a change and a lot of times you will you can contact the agency and they'll say no mm-hmm. you can't do that or yeah. yes you can do that yeah. when I was teaching or teaching when I was directing um, Putnam County Spelling Bee in Texas um, there were certain things I knew that were not going to fly with my audience in that area <laughs> and I'm like Fair. So yeah, so I'm like, can we change? And they were like, absolutely, no problem. Here, here's the options you have available as yeah. far as substitutions. It's like, okay, great. But, but that's, that's nice. the thing I want too, and that's what I'm always telling my students is like, you need to contact them. And a lot of times they're really generous with mm-hmm. that. But mm-hmm. if you don't, that's when you get in trouble. Yeah. And the other thing that's dumb too is like, it is 2024 and we have the internet. Yeah. So yes. when you do something stupid like you know cut a show or cast it the way it's not supposed to be or you know, do They're something super out. wonky with it. You can't be surprised that they found out yeah. about it and they shut you down. Yeah, there was a theater that I used to work for that uh, was doing a production of Grease, and apparently they found a song that had been cut from something, and they wanted to put it back in. Oh, and they wow. didn't ask for permission. Yeah. Oh. So two days before it opened, somebody from the MTI or whoever has the right sort called them up and said, "Shut it down. Yep, you're done." <laughs> and so they had already gotten to dress rehearsal, so they had all the technical elements were done, everything, and they had to shut it down. Oh, man. And I was like, that's your own fault. <laughs> I was yeah, like, you should have done that. Yeah, you can't just randomly <laughs> so. start taking stuff out and putting it back in. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I I know this question is in there, so I'm going to ask because I know that you have an interesting answer. Um, and having recently, I did see the flick recently. Um, I, my, uh, Sherry and I saw it on the very last uh, night. Oh, on the... This, was it Saturday or Sunday? Uh, or, uh, or closing, whatever the closing. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it was closing day, gotcha. I guess. Uh, and uh, I, I remember asking you, uh, so blocking, what do you what do you do with blocking? I know what you do. What do you do with blocking? <laughs> what do you mean, what do I do with it? Uh, do, are, are you someone who likes to sit down before, you know, okay, now this is my play, and then you sit down and you start to block stuff out? Well, I mean, there, there's a couple. It depends a lot on the show, for one. Yeah. Um, you know, because because different things, different needs. Um, for me, I always always try and have a rough plan of what I think is going to happen. Um, I don't. I'm not one of those who plans out every single moment. And it's like, okay, and now this is the moment where you go to the window and you raise your left hand, and like, then you're going to take your index finger. That drives me nuts. And okay. I'm like, I'm like, why do you even have actors? Like, just get some robots and make it happen. <laughs> So for me, um, I usually have like certain points or certain markers where I think things should happen. So I'll say something like, okay, when you get to this moment emotionally, I'd like you to be, you know, at the top of the stairs right. or near the window or something like Just that. Have a scene in, in your head maybe or a look in mind. Yeah. The, I, get, I think the only time I really, really plan something out is when it's maybe a lot of people or when it's something super complicated where like as an audience member you really need to be able to catch stuff or you're not going to know what's going on okay yeah but yeah i I try and keep it fairly open um it's also challenging too because it depends on the actors you know some if you don't give them something to do will just default to I'm standing stage center, I'm standing stage center, I'm <laughs> yeah. standing stage center. And it's like, well, there are more interesting things to do. <clears throat> I also, too, I get, I feel badly for designers when sets don't get used. 
when they like get all yeah. these great opportunities and then everybody stands down center and I'm like stands in the middle. Yeah. Why did you even bother with this set? Why mm-hmm. why are these curtains? Why are there four doors? It's like, yeah, I'd much rather make that happen. So one of my goals is always to make sure that like the whole space has been used. The, spe- in some the way. set and the space gets used. Because also especially if it's something that we've had to build or we've had to purchase, it's like good grief. It should not just be there and be pretty. There should be a reason for that. Yeah, so, it should have some functionality and yeah. actually use the thing. Yeah. Well, and you already, I mean, I don't block at all before I go into rehearsal. I might look at Yeah, the, that I, just yeah. blows my mind. I might look at the scene, but it's, it's different if it's huge. Like, if I direct a show that has, like, more than eight people in it, you have to plan ahead in terms of, like, oh, do I think this is how I want this to go. But I, I yeah, I rarely do any pre-blocking, if at all. Um, and especially when I, I usually direct shows that are smaller casts. And so okay. I, I'm able to get in there with the actors and really work. And I don't necessarily have to have something planned out. But I think if I was directing, like, like right now we're getting ready to open Big Fish. And there's no way in hell I could have gone into that rehearsal without a, without a plan. Because there's just so much going on. There's okay. choreography. And the way, I mean, I'm not directing it. so um, But, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that. But you know, when I directed Little Shop of Horrors, when I directed the, when I directed the flick, those are all small casts. I was like, yeah. I'd show up to rehearsal and be like, okay, this is what we're gonna work on. Let's go. Uh, and so, and then I just hone and trim and mold from that. But that's yeah. about it. But then, like two years ago, I directed Into the Woods, and I was like, okay, this is a show that's all about entrances and exits. And okay. so I like, you know, I was looking at the set. I'm looking at the floor plan. I numbered. Or I gave letters to each of the exits, so then I could tell the actors. It's like, okay, you're coming from A. You're going to do this part, and then you're going to exit D. You know, so so that they had something to go from, because otherwise, it's just you know, you're you're just lost. It's so, and, and it's so much of the storytelling. It's like, okay, this person can't see this person, or this person has to see this person. Mm-hmm. That that that's yeah. where it becomes really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. everybody does blocking different. That's in my little question thing but oh, we can talk about it yeah i know <laughs> pull that question yeah oh. no i i, I essentially oh, just, pulled that question just for us it. i i i fake pulled it yeah <laughs> well you fake pulled a question yeah, yeah. while you while you were being questions. the it super, super person that you are <laughs> yeah. he went ahead and asked a question that he knew was in there i knew i knew the oh, yeah. he actually the questions yeah. before. He's okay, because jamie's was, answer terrified i was i was searching for an extension cord does it terrify you as an actor uh, no, no, no. As, as, as a director, I can't imagine showing up and like, okay, well. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I will say, too, I have stuff also planned out because I've had circumstances in the past where some actors, like, have no clue what to do. Um, I've encountered that for sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. I directed an actor a few years ago. I was at a smaller school, and we had a young woman and just her personal experience because um, her parents were missionaries, and so she had lived in Africa until she was 17, she was homeschooled there. Okay. She's like Mean um, Girls. Yeah, Happening very much right so. Here. Very much so. <laughs> yeah. But like, she had no experience of like life in the U.S. And so like asking oh. her to do things, asking her to like even make a gesture, you know, I said, what would you do to indicate to somebody that you want, you know, you want them to come closer? And of course, all the other actors are like oh, this and, you know, all these different mm-hmm. options. And she's like, I don't know. I've never had to do that. Hmm. And I was just like, okay, wow. so wow. yeah, okay. so I had to adjust, and no so context. yeah, so I always have some sort of plan. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, we could be burning daylight and getting True. nothing done. Well, we so. do get a large, we get a large mm. gap of training experience. Like, because when I did the flick, there's only four people in it, but mm. one, the girl who played Rose, it was the first time she'd ever been on stage. Mm, she did great. She, Which she was very natural. Yeah, it was her first mm-hmm. show, and Never so I known. had to be ready for the lack of knowledge, but. We were able to, to get through it because my other three actors were very experienced. And so they sort of, but she was really good. She had good instincts, which I think is what I rely on in terms of like that. And I think if I run, and I have as well, run into people who are like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, well, then I'll tell you, right? Or we'll just respond to what for else sure. is going on stage. And if you have to do that, that's fine. But I don't plan for it because I'm lazy. <laughs> I will say too something I do that my, that my my actors know about, especially the ones who worked with me before. There's there's two things is um, one I hate people um, crossing their arms on stage just as a default uh, because it reads as I'm bored, mm-hmm. and okay. then as an audience member I can be sitting there and going, huh. I'm bored too. And it's just, we have so many different things we can do other than this. It's just a super easy mm-hmm. default. Or put your hands in your pockets. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so I actually, um, we like spend some time like in front of a mirror or in pairs. And they're like, they, you can do all these different things, but you can't cross your arms. You so they try that. Yeah. So that's one thing. The other is that um, 
I hate it when characters are always looking at each other. When it's this whole cobra and mongoose thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, because we don't do that in our day to day lives. Not without, you know? not without freaking people out. <laughs> no, right, yeah, exactly. Right. Because yeah. Yeah. we're yes. all, we're always, you know, we're folding laundry or we're making a call or we're checking yeah. the, you know, there's always something happening. And yeah. the thing, my big thing is like, if we're always looking at each other, it doesn't mean anything when we do look at each other mm-hmm. when it's important. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes I'll force them. I'm like, okay, we're going to run this scene. You can't look at each other. Yeah. And they are like ready to explode. But it's nice because then I can say, okay, when did you really want to? And I'm like, okay, here, okay, great. Yeah. Do it then. Do but it like, then, yeah. yeah, but not just the whole time, you know, going yeah. back and forth, yeah. looking at, you know, looking like the cats who are fighting the alley behind my house. <laughs> it's so funny, too, because like, um, you know, uh, the flick was in three quarters. It was in a three quarter space. So mm-hmm. at times my actors' backs are going to be at the audience. Like, can't, yes. You can't help it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I grew up. Uh, very traditionally trained and like one of my directors when I was younger was like you can't upstage yourself you have to always be facing out and I'm like what? (laughs) and so and like if you were turned with your back to the audience you just for some reason disappeared completely Yes. and you you know they couldn't see you and I had an actor in rehearsal that was his back was to the character he was talking to because he was doing stuff Mm -hmm. and he said should I wait until I can turn around and see her and I was like ew I was like, do you do that all the time? I was like, we're, I mean, just talk. You just talk. I was like, if I feel like you're sitting in one place too long, I'll tell you, you know, in terms of yeah. like, you know, I was like, you can't have your face to the audience over here and have your face to your audience over here at the same time. I said, what I need you to do is talk louder. Mm. So that the people over here who can't see your face can hear you. Mm-hmm. So as long yeah. as I can hear you and understand what you're saying, I don't have to see your face. Um, and so, time, but yeah. we've all worked with directors. I mean, one of my teachers was like die hard in terms of like always out or always at the person you were talking to. And I was like, Ugh, if you turned around with your back to the audience, that was like some sort of cardinal sin. Yeah. Well, because I'll get some students too who are maybe coming out of high school and they they have you know teachers who are like you never turn your back to the audience yeah. and i'm like how do you go out the door on stage <laughs> yeah, right. like do you back out the door yeah exactly yeah. but yeah so yeah I, i'm a huge like i try to in, encourage them to perform naturalistic behavior i'm like More just natural. do what you do right yeah. We're, just re- interact with the person like you would if you di- were you know off stage or whatever i was like try to we're telling a story we I'm, I'm not uh I don't have to, you, you don't have to, it, it looks fake to me, right? If you're yeah. artificially, you know, moving how you how you behave and how you respond to someone else For based sure. on some sort of, you know, actor concern or director concern. So I'm like, I'd much rather watch you have an actual conversation with somebody. And if you're so. mic'd up, it's not about projection, no, so no. you can get yeah. away with it. Yeah. Yeah. But. Next question. What do we got? If you had your dream ensemble and no financial constraints, <laughs> what <laughs> is the top production you would do? What would you do if you could do anything? Oh, anything, wow. best cast in the world, you get, you all get the money in the want, world. Money's not an option. Mm. You know, that's funny because for me, I, I actually, I find I like the limitations. Ooh. I like the whole notion of like, Ooh. you know, we don't have all the money or, or you know, I, you know, I can only cast these people. I find that super exciting. He's putting, um, the, he's putting this in his tenure file. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, just be, I, I, I think that's also, too, because that's what I've had to do in the past. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, well, so in the academia, whole notion, yeah. well and, and I think it's one of those things, too, where, like, if you could do anything, you kind of get paralyzed because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I could, but, but then I could also do Too many know, so, options. Too yeah. many options, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I got hired once to, to paint a mural um, in a ballroom at a country club. And um, and I said, well, what do you want? And he's like, oh, whatever you want, and blah blah blah. You know, you just I want it to be something kind of neutral, so it'll work for a lot of different events. But you know, whatever you want. And I ended up having to give up the job. I'm like, I just can't just like I can't give you whatever poof, you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. So, hmm. yeah. I think I mean, too I, much. I, I I kind of agree. I mean, we we are creative within the limitations that we're given. Uh-huh. It forces you to think creatively, um, which I think is probably one of the skills that we're good at, right? Um, yes. But uh, yeah, it's, it's you you ask that question. It's very parallel to the question, "What's your favorite show you've ever worked on?" Yeah. Which I can never answer. Uh, mm-hmm. um, That's in here somewhere. Oh my gosh! Well, don't ask that one. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, if what you're asking is like. What's my favorite story, or that I want to tell, or what's my favorite play that I want to do? I don't even know if I can answer that. There's so many. Mm-hmm. 
I'm a big fan of a lot of things. I'm, I, I've i never worked on or directed or designed a production of Funny Thing Happened on the way to the forum. Oh, wow. And I've always wanted to. Really? Yeah. Not very popular today, probably. Uh, there's some stuff in it that might, might be. Say, yeah. yeah. And so, but it's just so funny. And the music is, is so funny. good. It is really good. Uh, so, you know, it's just it's, that's an old chestnut that I've never had the opportunity to do, but. I mean, I didn't think I'd ever do Chekhov, and I directed Cherry Orchard recently, so that's there you go. Yeah. Just sort of put that right off the list because I actually don't like Chekhov, so right. that was a great challenge. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, yeah. When actually, well, and that's one of the questions uh, on there is, did you have you ever had to direct anything that you did not like? Well, I had to make myself like it. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and, and that's the thing. Do you, I mean, so so most recently you did Chekhov. And I you, did. Well, when they called me, like no, when they called me to ask me to direct it, I directed a cherry orchard at, at Dome University in Crete two years ago, and uh, the faculty that worked there are friends of mine. I love them to death. They call me up. Hey, do you want to direct cherry orchard? And I said, Well, this, I'm either the best person to call or the worst. And she <laughs> was like, Why the worst? I was like, I don't like Chekhov. I think it's boring and out of date, and I don't think anybody should be producing it today. Uh, and she said, <laughs> and she said, shots fired. And she said, so why why would you be the perfect person? I said, because I don't like Chekhov. Because I, would, I yeah. if I'm going to direct it, I'm going to make it something that the students and your audience and your audience can relate to, and that I'm not going to get bored with. And so uh, I did it, but the only reason that the only thing that saved me was they kept sending me adaptations of Cherry Orchard, and I'd read like three pages and be like, nope. Nope, Mm. because they were just boring. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I found an adaptation of The Cherry Orchard by the playwright who wrote The Humans. I can't remember his name. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Yes. Um, I can look it up. Oh, yes. Uh, But anyway, I read it on a plane. Mm. I bought it. I read it on a plane. I couldn't put it down. I read the whole thing because it read to me like a Wes Anderson version of the cherry orchard <laughs> the dialogue was contemporary That's the relations fine. between the characters were clear it was funny uh yeah it had all of those things that i think Chekhov was supposed to have but people just keep squashing it out of him because they don't know how to, to do it Stephen? and i'm not Stephen Karam. Karam, yes uh and i'm not an expert in any way shape or form and check off and would never cl- uh, declare to be but i i think that we've sort of missed the point, and it becomes this classic chestnut of a museum piece, right? Okay. Um, and I'm like, if I, if the audience can't relate to these characters that are so far removed from them, then we've wasted their night. But this adaptation, Karam's adaptation of The Cherry Orchard, is contemporary and funny, and it was charming and just lovely. And so I went back and I said, I will do this version. And they were like, oh, we have to pay for rights for that. <laughs> Cherry Orchard is, is free. Oh, yeah. And I was like, I was like, well, you're going to have to do it because I'm not doing it. any of those other versions. I was yeah. like, this is the yeah, only I don't, one. I don't want to do the translation from 1909. No. Thanks, oh, though. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but this, and the students were able to relate to the, to the, to the uh, story and the, the – and I was able to really, and it made it better for everybody. So I was proud of it because, but if I hadn't found that, I don't know what I would have done. Well, you're a playwright. You might have adapted it. Ugh, I'm not going to adapt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I mean, this, I might get fired. Oh, no, I have tenure. Uh, I, might, I might get fired for this, but I think Chekhov belongs in the classroom. Mm. And I think it's important that they mm-hmm. study Chekhov, especially in classic yeah. classic training in terms of performance and, and reading scripts. And But I think Chekhov in terms of – there's a reason that professional theaters don't do Chekhov unless they have Jake Gyllenhaal or Molly Gyllenhaal to play a role because they can't sell tickets. Yeah. Nobody's going to come see Joe Schmo and his friends do a production Dude, of Cherry off. Orchard yeah. on Broadway. Now, if you get John Malkovich to be in it or something like that, yes, yeah. I will shell out sure. the hundreds of dollars to see it, and I won't give a shit what the play's about. Right. I just came to see John Malkovich, right? <laughs> right. And so that's the only reason people pull that stuff off nowadays. I mean, that's the reason that when Hedda Gabler was in, on, in Broadway not too long ago, the cast was full of stars because mm-hmm. nobody's going to sit through Hedda Gabler yeah. unless they're there for another reason. Yeah, they're, they're there for the people, yeah. Yeah, and so I think Chekhov is brilliant, but Chekhov is a training tool in my in my opinion, and I'm not sure that we should be doing it doing it maybe in yeah, academia may be the perfect place to do it right mm-hmm. but i don't think you're going to find a lot of professional theaters producing a lot of check off yeah i do think it's good training i, th- I think there can be good productions of checkup mm-hmm. but you have to have the right actors mm-hmm. you have to have the right director you have to somebody who who really cares about it the other thing too is i think it was richard nelson was talking about um working on a translation of one of the plays and he was working from a literal translation from from the russian that that um 
this Russian scholar did for him. And part of what he discovered is there's a lot of stuff in Chekhov that, in fact, is really funny, but you don't get it because the translations tend to, like, clean it up. So, like, there, there's, like, swearing and stuff that, yeah. like, doesn't always happen yeah. because it's like, you know, it's like, oh, we can't have that. So, you know, mm, it gets okay. it gets cleaned up out of there. And it's actually, that's the best part of it. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that can be a real challenge. Is, is Yeah, translation is huge in terms of that. I think... I saw, which one did I see? I saw, um, it wasn't Cherry Orchard. Um, I think it was Uncle Vanya at Steppenwolf and really enjoyed it and was surprised because that one, I love and hate Chekhov, and, but that one is not one I've ever been a big fan of. And I was like, wow, I am really engaged with this. What happened? Yeah. But it was just yeah. a really solid production. So, hmm. yeah. yeah well, so It's always funny too because... Um, I, the last production of Chekhov that I was involved with, I, I was just a mentor to one of the students, and it was at a different university. And the, the director told me we were doing Three Sisters, and I was sitting in his office, and, he, and I, I'm terrible at disguising my face, so <laughs> my face is very clear in terms of what I'm thinking. And he looked at me, and he was like, you don't like Three Sisters? I was like, well, I don't really like Chekhov. And he said, well, it's going to be great. And I'm like, well, how can you guarantee that? And he was like, <laughs> well, I understand the humor of Chekhov. It's going to be funny. And I was like, can I record that? And will you <laughs> sign a piece of paper? And I need some sort of bet on this because I went to a dress rehearsal of it and literally I fell three, I fell asleep three times in the first act mm-hmm. because it was so freaking boring. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, well, no one was laughing. What happened to the, that your confidence that, you know, this boisterous confidence that you had that Chekhov was funny because it was not. Hmm. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I said, oh, and I got really lucky with Doan uh, because my cast was great and the students all bought into it 100% from the day I walked in to the day we opened. A lot of that had to do with the fact that I was a guest, right? I wasn't their regular teachers. Sure. Uh, so I think they put forth more effort and they were like more excited about working on a project when they were bringing in a new, you know, sure. some sort of guest mm-hmm. artist. Uh, but they were all fantastic and they worked their heinies off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, I did crazy things. Like I had a band on stage that this is Wes Anderson got in me because I literally had a band come on during the scene changes to help alleviate any issues with those. And I made them part of the party scene as well. And they were all dressed in like punk clothing and played Joan Jett songs on acoustic guitars. That's so cool. that's that was the Wes Anderson version, uh, uh, a sort of <laughs> element of that play. But uh, um, but yeah, oh man, uh, there are so many of those too, like Ibsen and... You know, it's like they're brilliant, and the students need to to do them. But I'm not going to force anybody to sit through an entire production of The Iceman Cometh or Move from the Spagotten or <laughs> some of these plays that I've done in the past. That I'm like, wow, this mm-hmm. is harsh. This is long. <laughs> Talking about long. Uh, uh, but, well, but, but beautiful. The production of Move from the Misbegotten I saw was absolutely stunning, and I know I cried at the end. But it's still long, mm-hmm. and to somebody that's not connected to theater the way that we are, I don't understand how they would sit through it. Sit through it, yeah. And I think it's tough too with some of the older shows too, because you're you're they're often deal- you're dealing with such an age range, and like twenty somethings do not have the same experience mm-hmm. as fifty somethings, mm-hmm. and sure. asking them to try and embody all that, yes, they can maybe get there, mm-hmm. but. I would rather have them play something closer to their own experience. Mm -hmm. Also, too, I I always get concerned with younger actors playing older actors because, yeah, yeah, because they get the whole thing of, you know, they're hunched over and acting (laughs) like they have a cane and they're going, oh, I'm old. I'm 42. I'm like, you shut (laughs) up. You stop that. (laughs) You you, you said something about talking about the university setting in academia. That's hard. Yeah. That's that, hard for us because the, uh, we did a production of uh, Death of a Salesman not too long ago. Okay. Well, Biff and Happy were, we brought in uh, guest artists to play Willie and uh, what's her face? The wife. Linda. Linda. So Linda. Willie and Linda were actually people of their age. Of, of, of the age, okay. But the two sons, we let college guys play that. Well, Biff and Happy were in their 30s. Right. They're not 19. No. Right? They're... And so we're asking a 19 year old to understand Biff Loman? That's not going to happen. He's not going to get there. He doesn't have the tools for that yet, right? And that's one of the things that we struggle with a lot. Like uh, anytime Theatrics wants to do a show that has an older character, and I'm like, well, you better save your money so you can bring somebody in to play this. Because you can't play a 70-year-old man, not because I don't want you to or I'm being a jerk. It's because you don't understand anything about being a 70-year-old man. You've never been there, and you never will until you're 70 years old. And I think, and we do that too. Like they play above their age. Uh, Like we're doing Big Fish, and the guy who's playing the father is 19. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. Um, and we see him at all different ages during that thing. But when he's playing the older father, it's hard to believe because he's nineteen. But uh, you know, when we teach the students too, I'm like, you know, you might be playing a thirty year old in this show. 
you might be playing a 50 year old in the show this is the only time you're ever going to do that you're never mm-hmm. going to get cast outside what you are what your age appearance is mm-hmm. once you leave school yeah well if you're doing realistic work yes yes so because there are some some shows where you're hopping back and yeah. forth in time and that type of thing yeah. sure 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 yeah but it's uh yeah it's like doing arsenic and old lace with uh, college kids which right. i did when i was in grad school and even though the grad students who played the two old ladies were older i think they were in their 30s or 40s you still had to right you know, it was just yeah. like someone that just wasn't believable yeah uh, and so but that's not it's it's also very di- difficult for us to find material mm-hmm. that is accessible and also appropriate for where they are in their training and that they can connect with um it's one of the reasons actually I, i'm not Stop trying to promote myself as a big fan of Mean Girls the Musical. But one of the reasons that it works so well is because everybody that I saw on the touring company had just graduated from college. Oh. Mm, so they sure. were all so young. Sure. Right? And so they that's material that is geared toward their age range and their age and they could understand those characters. So it's just hard when you're asking somebody, it's impossible to say to a student who's twenty years old, Okay, I want you to understand life as I do as a fifty six year old man. Mm-hmm. Go. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So where in the university would they learn some of these um, different – where would they learn Ibsen and, and oh, We and have Chekhov? a style, we mean, have a styles have a, class that they work if on. If they're there. not going to perform it, do they – Well, I mean, I mean, or? we st- they still perform it to some extent, whether it's, you know, yeah, class choices or something like that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, we just haven't done a lot of them, too, because also, too, a lot of times they're expensive to do in yeah. terms of, like, the yeah. costumes required and the mm-hmm. interiors required and that oh, sort of right. thing. Sure. You know, we don't necessarily have a lot of, you know, furniture sitting around from 1895 that's mm-hmm. in really good shape. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so we don't, we don't always do that. We do them from time to time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think they do get the training. It's just, yeah, not as maybe as frequent. And the thing is, is they're not necessarily asking us for it. They're not mm. saying like, oh, I really want to do checkout. I'm, I'm like, you know, you will have a chance to do that. And I said, if you're like looking at other work, if yeah. you're going out and auditioning for things, if you go to grad school, yeah, sure, that that can absolutely happen. But yeah, but they're not sitting there going like, oh, I really wanted to do O'Neill. And it's like, <laughs> I haven't heard that yet. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't Although, know if they read it in one of uh, them. Well, they, they, oh, yeah. They read them in the, in the theater history classes, yeah. and we have a script analysis class, and so, and then we have a styles performance class, I think, and they, they alternate what they do in those classes. Mm-hmm. But they do scenes from Chekhov and oh, things okay. like that. Um, in fact, we just did the Glass Menagerie mm. at the Rep maybe four maybe four years ago, yeah. and it was okay. But we brought mm-hmm. in the two main performers because mm-hmm. we don't have anybody that can play the mother. I mean, mm-hmm. be like trying to do Streetcar with college kids, which I've seen, and it was terrible. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, but it's also hard too because you you have to find that material that they can right. they that the audience wants to see and that they can connect with and right. Connect with, so we sure. have to do a whole season of just Spring Awakening. Is that, yeah. you know, we have to do that well, over and over again. It's, it's part of why it's one of the reasons when I teach playwriting, I'm always talking to my students. I'm like, if you can write some decent stuff for actors in your age range, and I said especially if there's any humor. I said, that will get done all over the country Mm because everybody's looking for those scripts. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of really crappy ones out there. And so, like, if you can, you know, do anything that's got some some heft behind it and some heart behind it, like, people will be so excited to work on that. So, Mm -hmm. Late teens, early 20s, age range. Yeah, yeah. And and usually even the ones that are written that have those characters in there, there's always one. There's always one parent, one grandparent. One older person that you still have to you still have to deal yeah, with, right? Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, they're just. I mean, I we should start some sort of list. Of just here are plays that are totally occupied <laughs> by teenagers, by younger folks, or yeah. by yeah, people so. between the age of fifteen and twenty five, mm-hmm. you know, or something like that. But yeah, that but then also challenge. you lose such an audience. Like you start doing touring shows, or you start doing professional theaters, start doing shows that are only done by fifteen to twenty five year olds. The older people aren't going to come see it. Right. So yeah. They're going to be like, that's not how it was when I was 18. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. and things have changed, too, because now even the high schools are doing shows geared towards older actors. Like something rotten. Um, I saw, I, when, I, when I was teaching yeah. in Texas, I saw, I went to their, um, not, they don't do thespians, they do their separate Texas thing, because it's Texas. Oh, okay. Um, but I saw a high school production of Wit. Yeah. Oh my! Yes. Oh. oh my! And and okay, it's it's problematic enough that you have you know an actor who's seventeen 
playing a woman who's supposed to be like in her 50s. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing mm -hmm. here is, it's a woman going through cancer. So she's supposed to have, you know, the shaved head and everything. Mm -hmm. um, this actor was known for her long, beautiful hair. Oh. Oh, no. And so they just braided it really tight and they did a skin wig. And it was awful, and it was lumpy. Mm. And then as she was acting, she was like moving around, and it started to shift. And we were like waiting for her head to oh, break open geez. like an alien. And it was just like, oh, why man. are you doing this? That's yeah, not good. Why? It's, it's like, where is Christopher Guest? Is he filming here? Yeah. It's like, what is going on? So, it's it's something. I, well, you know, I guess, and but I've been doing this for 29 years. And so I, season after season, after you're trying to come up with things, you know, to teach mm -hmm. the students, to stretch them, but then also not to provide them with obstacles that they can't overcome. Right? Sure. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. super hard. And I couldn't imagine, and I never wanted to be or do want to be a high school theater teacher mm -hmm. because, yeah. holy cow, uh, it's hard enough coming up with stuff to do with college-age folks. Just go back, you know, five, seven years, and now i got to come up with stuff to do with them. Yeah. But uh, I think they could have probably made a better choice than wit. Yeah. I, Where's, uh, where uh, is there a... a, a a resource or a set of resources that you guys like going to at this point for for uh, stuff that, that, that you guys specifically are looking for? Or is it just kind of, man, wherever? I, I read a lot of plays. Yeah, you're just, but, just constantly reading. Yeah, I read a lot. I also, um, because I know so many other people in academia, I'm always like touching base with them like, okay, what have you seen that really excited you? Or what did your students and, love working on? Yeah. Um, so that can make a real difference. Um, also, I'm on New Play Exchange a lot where, mm -hmm. where writers are posting their own work. And, mm -hmm. so, and nice. some of it, yeah, is crap, but some of it is really, really good. <laughs> and there are things. But then that also becomes tough too because then – you're not necessarily going to get the same box office because it's not well known. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's right. also such a tough thing to balance. Right. It's like, but I haven't heard of it. And I'm like, yes, that's why we want you to come to it because it's not everything <laughs> right, else you've you seen. Right, because you haven't seen it before. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And it's tough, too, in Omaha because we have so many other theaters in terms of community theaters and everything else. Yes. We're trying not to do the thing mm -hmm. that everybody that else everybody, is doing. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and, and, and being a school, you, that, that does free you up for, for, from some of it because you, you, you could usually tell what when a play gets released right because right. then here it comes yeah. on everybody's docket yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah. well because one of our students really 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 wanted us to do Heathers next year and I'm like y'all Mm. Midland is doing Heathers. Mm -hmm. Creighton is doing Heathers. Mm -hmm. Snap is doing Heathers. I said, mm -hmm. we don't need four productions yeah, in one city Heathers. in a nine-month span. Yeah. We just don't. Yeah. Yeah. So, so fortunately, he auditioned for the summer productions. Yeah, Good. Say, no, yeah. Enjoy. Like yeah. Have a great for. time. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's tough because if you're trying to sell tickets, if you're trying to get something known, yeah, every, everybody's mm -hmm. going to fight and compete for those. So. Mm -hmm. For sure. And the high schools are usually going to snag it first, so yeah, because they don't, yeah, they don't oh. have to. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, better. Licensing. Well, yeah, they don't have to deal with the, the licensing stuff that the uh, the regular theaters do. But that's interesting. I mean, it's interesting to think that that it's hard for you to think about doing a production where you don't have limitations. Mm -hmm. Sure, it just well, goes to show are. how much problem solving goes into. Yeah. yeah, a lot of problem solving. Yeah, how do I do this with what I have? Mm -hmm. It's the and, name of the game. And I don't know if this one, I think we might need to skip this one because I don't think you guys use flats. No, not much anymore. Um, every so often, but yeah, yeah. not that yeah. much. Not a lot so of flats, skip that yeah. One. That's more of a... Um, well, it kind of tags on to what we're talking about. What kind of work are you interested in at the moment? <sighs> we kind of touched on it. For me, I think I want to do something... As much as I can, I want to do something different every time. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, some t directors are like, oh, I'm really good with this, and that's what I want to do. But mm -hmm. I'm always wanting to challenge myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I've done something really new, then I'd like to do something old and really look at, like, other ways of doing it. Or, you know, gee, I haven't done anything, you know, that is a translation that's maybe an older thing. What is out there? Um, I've been really lucky because I've gotten to, even just in my time at UNL, I've gotten to do new scripts. I've gotten to do older scripts. Um, I've gotten to do musicals and not. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always looking for that challenge. That's what's super exciting to me. And also, it's usually what's going to challenge my students, and then they get excited about it. That's always my hope when I'm teaching theater history and we're reading plays is they'll get excited about something. We read something um, a couple of weeks ago, and... I was shocked because they were all excited and they're like, we want to do this. We want to, and it's like, 
who are you? Wow. Like, that's <laughs> never happened. Yeah. It's like, okay, so that is now going into, um, not for next year, but our, into our possible rotation for 25-26. Yeah. yeah cause it's like, I had a student the other day that came to me and said, have you heard of this play, No Exit? <laughs> and I was like, yes. yes. We read it in theater history. I really like it. I was like, you do? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, no, we're not going to do it. But uh, <laughs> thanks. Thank, I'm glad you got excited. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I, 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 I don't know. I just like good story. Uh, I don't. I just. I'm, I'm attracted to that. I, I'm directing a show in the fall, and the whole reason I'm doing it is, well, it's part of a new play festival, and for some reason, people like. I don't know why, but oftentimes when people want me to direct new stuff. Um, but uh, this is a new play, and uh, uh, after I read it, I was like, well, it's just charming. Yeah. You know, and it has these great relationships, and it's just a really good story to tell, which is, I think, what I look for. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like you were talking, it has to excite me, it has to excite the cast, and it has to excite the audience, because right. you know, we want to try to find things that are going to do that across the board uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, it sounds really schmaltzy, but I'm just, I'm so story-driven in terms of, like, if it's a good, strong story and mm-hmm. it's well-written, I'm in it. I'm there. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's not, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't really just, want anything to do with it. Uh, it but sometimes, you know, it's the, there's a challenge. You know, uh, mm-hmm. but I it's, it's like I try to teach my students this too. It's like you know, how do you work on a project you don't like? Well, it doesn't. You have to find a reason to like it, and that's because yeah. you learn about yourself, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm super fortunate because in the past four years or three years, no one's offered me a show to direct that I didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. So I got super lucky so far. That is fortunate, yeah. And usually for me, I don't think I don't think I've ever done one that I didn't like. I think it's just one that like didn't necessarily connect with me. I, w- mm-hmm. I was, I uh, there was one instance where some friends asked me, and they were casting themselves, but they asked me to direct them in Sam Shepard's Fool for Love, and I'm like, I appreciate Shepard, but I'm like, why would you come to me? Like knowing mm-hmm. the other things, I'm like, that is just a really really odd choice but yeah. like I did it because I really liked everybody involved and like let's do it and sure. we had a great time and I really enjoyed it mm-hmm. um, and what was interesting was our um, designer he's like you know I've worked on this show three times before and he said this is the first time I've seen it where I've really felt like Eddie and May really care about each other nice. which I took as a huge compliment because yeah. yes. I'm like yeah. you know especially going in going like eh, I don't know but okay I'll do my best yeah. so <laughs> well and you're talking you just mentioned this as well a lot of it's about personalities right mm-hmm. if somebody asks me to direct sure. a show and I'm not 100% sure about it and then they say well this person is your stage manager or this person is your designer. I'm like, well, I love them. So yeah, right. let's just right. do it. Mm-hmm. And then if, you know, we'll find a way. Cause uh, that's my answer. Usually when someone says, what's your favorite play you've ever worked on? Uh, it's not about the play anymore. It's about the people in the room. Yeah. So yeah. if yeah. I can get when, if I can get in the room with the people that I like working with, I'll direct no exit. I matter. don't care. Yeah, we'll have, we'll find a way to tell the story. Uh, because it's more about the people now than mm-hmm. it is about the process, really. Because yeah. I like getting in the same, I like getting in the room with people that I respect and I love to work with, and uh, it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference on the project. So, and and actually, I was going to talk to you guys about this off microphone, so I'll edit some of this. But um, I'm wondering how many times when you sit down to do your season. Are you are you looking around and seeing what has been done? So we're, okay, that's off the table. Or do do you want to see what's been done in the area and what's going to be done before you even decide your your seasons? I mean, it's it's helpful to know. I would rather choose something that's not being done elsewhere, especially calendar wise. If they're going to do it first, yeah. I would rather not be following on the yeah. heels. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's tough because, you know, some places don't announce until really late. With us, we're trying to really, because we're trying to design our shows a semester ahead. So we're our goal is always to have our season for the following year chosen by, like, November of the previous year. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't made it for a couple of years. We usually have most of it, but then there's, like, one or two things that are still up in the air. We thought we were all set to go for next year, and then our show for number four, um, we couldn't get the rights to because suddenly there was a national tour, and it's like, ah, crap, here we go again yeah so yeah i mean we are looking at what other people are doing you know some folks don't care that much about it i do want to have that in mind Mm -hmm. when when we're choosing just just Mm -hmm. because i also you know think there should be other opportunities to see other scripts there's so many out there it's Mm -hmm. like why do the same one 
you yeah. know, five times in, in one zip code. Mm-hmm. And um, it also depends yeah. on what audience you draw. Like, sure. We, we do our seasons way ahead just like that. So, like, our season for next year has been set for, like, the last few months because mm-hmm. we already have to start working on it. Right. But when you're choosing a, a season in an academic institution, you have so many other aspects of the process that you have to uh, – consider right Mm -hmm. um but i know we're doing a show in the fall that has recently been done in omaha but our audiences are right not the same right and so it's okay and we have a relatively vibrant but small theater theater community in lincoln yeah and so we we do take a glance around and if somebody's done it recently it just depends because sometimes we'll be in the room and we're trying to figure out the season somebody will say a title and i'll be like oh well uh, lcp did that last year and they're like well we have different audiences this is no big deal and i'm like all right Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, so that's sort of how Mm -hmm. it goes i think I think you're exactly right. You know, I, if I was the artistic director of Lincoln Community Playhouse, I would always want to know what Omaha Community Playhouse is doing because mm-hmm. they tend to do the same damn shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, yeah. and, and but those audiences are different. Yeah, right. Are. And so there aren't a lot of people that are going to drive to Lincoln to see a show. And if you're in Lincoln and you're going to drive to Omaha, you're going to see a Broadway tour or you know something out of theater that you're really already connected to yeah. so i don't think we have a lot of cross pollination in terms of audiences yeah. and Doesn't and we oftentimes do in academia we do things that other people can't do right right, right. we're going to do an oscar wilde play that i won't name uh because i don't know if it's been publicized uh that we're doing it but we're doing it in the fall and nobody's going to do that no 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 community no theater around us is going to do right. oscar wilde Nobody's not often that. right right and so um that's a pretty safe bet for us uh so but yeah i think uh you do i think it is important to look at what's going on around the community but we're unfortunately in the academic world a little isolated right and all the other things that we have to think about when we're choosing a season sort of somewhat protects us from that right yeah. But, yeah. But yeah yeah it is i think it's a necessary thing to look at yeah. Well, and I mean, we're four blocks from the Omaha Community Playhouse. So yeah, we want right. to have an idea. Yeah. But the thing is, is like our yeah. season was determined long before they mm-hmm. announced theirs. Mm-hmm. And actually, we were really lucky because it, it was like, oh, nothing they're doing is anything that we had on <laughs> yeah. the table. So yeah. Yeah, we're totally fine there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, really every every theater group and company and school has a mission, has a vision, right. right? And so I don't really see that a lot of those, especially at Lincoln, there aren't a lot, there's not a lot of overlap in terms of mission and vision of the of the community, uh, of the institutions that are producing theater. They, they maybe have all really specific visions that don't always overlap, so. Uh, I was thinking at the end, if we could do this the controversial one. You want to do the yes no questions? <laughs> the the yes, dance no, off. And it's just, we're going <laughs> to yes, play yes no. no. Oh, jeez. Uh, and, I suck at that game. Just yes and no. All and right. there's just a few questions. And I'm out. <laughs> yeah, right. It's Saying yes and no. Oh, I think. I'll just do this a lot. No. no. <laughs> I guess you could plead the fifth if you want. There's just a few, and I'm, okay. I'm hoping to add to it as we do these. Okay. Plays are just as good as musicals. Yes. Yes. Mm, I agree as well. Cast should not receive their audience in costume. Should yes. not. Should not. Should yes. not. Yes. You're not a fan of going out afterwards. I'm and, not. Yeah. Too many things can happen. Stuff can get lost. Stuff can get damaged or stained. It's like why risk it? If you're doing um, children's theater, it's fun to stay in character. That's and meet a different the kids. thing. Yeah. That's the only time, only time you should ever do that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cash should be able to clap for themselves and others at curtain. Is I don't give a shit an acceptable? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I do. I do. Mm, this is, I can't do yes or no on this because I don't like the thing. Right. Okay. I, I like it when they do like if there's an orchestra mm-hmm. and they're like, hey, the orchestra, because everybody knows there's an orchestra there. Uh, but if they point at the booth. The audience has no clue really? what they're doing. I don't think they do. I don't think oh. the audience gets it. They're like, "Why is that to us?" Yes, yes, we're great. So I don't, I don't, I, I got, I got kind of yelled at when I directed the show recently, really? and I was, and the cast was like, "Into curtain call, they did this," and I was like, "What are you doing?" Everybody does and that. And they were like, "We were referring to the booth." I was like, "No, we're not doing that." <laughs> our, see, ours is easier there because our booth is, tends to be at the side of the performance mm-hmm. space, so, so they can see they, them. Then, like, you can see that there's a window, yeah, and you can yeah. see that. Like, I'm sitting, always so. like, if you're going to point at something, I need to be able to see what you're pointing at <laughs> My, I'm, I'm okay with it as long as it doesn't make curtain call longer yeah, yeah. i want curtain oh. call short Me i too. don't Fair. want it to be big and indulgent no, i don't need, too, i don't so. let any of my actors bow separately no matter what the show is i just Everybody did a little shop together. they all bowed together i was like you come out you get one bow okay. you get the hell out 
I so. do, but I warn my actors. I'm like, okay, this is going to be the hardest part for you for the whole show because it is going to go so fast. And you're yeah. going to be running so much. Yes. Oh, yeah. Because right. I don't want the whole, I'm going to take my con- yeah. time to come yes. to center stage <laughs> and look left and look right. <laughs> and now I'll be- And I'm like, sorry, Margo Fontaine, that's not you. Okay. Yeah. Get yeah. moving. I'm like, come out, get in line, bow, get off. Yep. That's, I love okay. it. That's it. Back to yes and no. Yes. Sorry. I love Sorry. it. No, that's through. okay. No, I just that's have good. a couple no. more. No, that's good. I will have more the next time. Okay. Uh, most of your audience will research the show before they see it. No. No. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Yeah. Belting is annoying. I'm on yes on that, just so you know. Belting? Belting. What's belting? Well, only if it's, well, it's, it's necess- when sometimes it's necessary in the song. But right. it's people not get up there and just all they do is just yeah. belt. I, I don't mind belting. Ah. What what I don't like is the whole like let me scream for money yeah. notes. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't like the this is my American Idol audition. Yes. Yes. that's what I don't like. Yeah, no. Belting is fine. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Merman, but if, yeah, if, it's, you, if they use fair. it when it's necessary and they use it properly, right. it's okay. Yep. It's like a thing. It's like yeah. some girls specifically. It's yeah. it's like they have to do it, and they they think they're pretty Olympic. Mm. <laughs> and, it, and it's also tough too it, because it some people who really want to do it can't tell that they're not doing it on pitch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah, then there's exactly. The, yeah, or they don't. Rough. Yeah, they don't stay on pitch. They start mm-hmm. there and they don't. They stay. wander. Yes. And last one. Would you rather direct a musical or a play? I know we did musicals. Plays or musicals, but how do you feel about musicals? Directing musicals. Have you have you done a musical? I just did Little Shop. Yeah, so you year. did Little Shop. Yeah. And I guess you did the one with Gordon that was kind oh, of a Godspell. musical. Yeah, yeah. Godspell. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you Godspell. I don't have a yes or no answer because I would like to do both. I do both. Okay. I like to do both. I will. I will say. There are some I will do and some I won't do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was working with the community theater a few years ago, directed a musical for them. They loved having me. Like The actors were excited. Everybody working there was excited. And they're like, we really want you to direct next year. I'm like, okay, great. And, I, and they're like, what are you interested in? I gave them like 30 titles. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, okay, great. And then I get the call like three weeks later. It's like, okay, we figured out our seasoning. We want you to direct. I said, okay, what do you got? And he, he's like, we want you to direct Chorus Line. And I said, uh, great. No. Yeah, yeah not he's like, but we really want you. I said, no. It's not he's I like, why? And I said, because it is the most boring one to do as a director. Uh, yeah. I said, because your blocking is determined by the title. They're yeah. standing on a line, or they're doing the choreography. I'm not doing the choreography, so all I'm really doing is scene work and coaching monologues. I said, there's nothing interesting or new I can do with Chorus Line. Yeah. It's a great show. I will come see it, but I don't want to direct it. And I would have said the same thing until they said, well, we're going to pay you this much. <laughs> and then I'd have been like, okay. <laughs> I also knew what they paid. So, yeah. That, so, that's yeah, good. So, yeah. Because, in yeah. fact, the one I had done for them, I directed and choreographed because it was one where it was simple enough I could. But I was yeah. like, yeah, mm-hmm. not for this one. Yeah, I've, so, I yeah. have taken some gigs before when I'm like, oh, daddy needs a new couch. <laughs> <laughs> so... It and happens. A, and a new bottle of specifically specific rum. Yes. Oh, that rum is great. <laughs> they came to my house. Uh-huh. <laughs> we did one of these in my dining room. It was the, awesome. In the lair. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In the lair. It was awesome. It was fun. We have to do that again. We should bring. Absolutely. You should. Have, we should have one of the round tables there. Yeah. There you go. Around my oblong table. That there would be go. great. But I only have four chairs. That's right. <laughs> We've often thought maybe we should get an RV, and then we just become the podcast. Oh, oh there you go. That would be pretty cool. RV. Just drive around. <laughs> Why not? I could collapse on a couch while we're talking. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, could someone bring me some popcorn? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, we'll exactly. Do. We'd have to win some money for that one. Oh, he's going to give you some of his lot of Yeah, right. he is. No, that's right. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you for participating yes, in the thank first you guys so much. of so much our fun. director roundtables. We want to have you back, and this was awesome. I think it worked out well. Yeah, no, we had and a great we, time. And we didn't hit all of the questions. That's okay. We got a whole bunch left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got some for next time. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank Absolutely. You Glad to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening and supporting the arts in the Platte River area and beyond. Please subscribe to our podcast so you are sure to catch all of our future episodes and join us on social media. See you next time on the Platte River Bard.